This is Justice Matters with Tim Buxton, coming to you from Yugambeh country of the Commonberry people of the Gold Coast, Australia. I'm your host, Tim, where my sole aim is to share conversations I get to have with inspiring people doing remarkable work to create a world where we all belong. This podcast is brought to you by the Just Travel Company. Experience wonder and unearth justice and discover the just way to travel today. Visit just-travel.co. Without further ado, here's our guest for this episode of Justice Matters. Well, here we are. So great to have you on the podcast, Kelly. Uh, it's been a, a little minute since we last saw each other. I think we we're racing around after our little kids. Uh, well, they're not little anymore. Our kids are probably like four or five. I um, know mine's four. How old is Carter? Five. Five. He's five. Yeah. A little person. <laughs> a little person. Oh, my gosh. Aren't they? They just, uh, and they're both, um, oh, they both seem to enjoy each other's company and and seem to keep us on our toes anyway. So it's so um so thankful that you would um carve out the time. You're all the way in Dubai. You are the head or the executive director, the leader, whatever you want to um call it of the AI Asia Pacific Institute. I love that the logo is on the screen there because I butchered it last time I tried to say <laughs> I was just thinking that, yeah. A lot of people seem to have trouble. Um, we actually sorted to AI, API, but it seems it still gets people confused. So we got to work on changing the name eventually. <laughs> AI, API. I like that. It's got a nice ring to it. Um, yeah. I love, I mean, this is actually our second crack. We had a few technical difficulties before, but our, I was absolutely loving where we were going. Um in our conversation about AI and the challenges and the future and how it impacts the, you were talking about the social implications, the, the, the ethical implications, the, there's so many things that um, technology, which is at the best of times can save lives and at the worst of times can destroy the planet and destroy what it means to be human. Really um, so much to talk about. How do we nail it down? Um, first of all, though, could you explain to our listeners, our audience, who AI API is, what your role is, uh, give us a little kind of nutshell and, um, yeah, what you kind of do on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, sure. So we essentially address the implications of artificial intelligence, right? So we talk about implications, they can be social, ethical, legal. So it's quite broad, right? If you think about social implications, well, what what can that possibly be? Well, there's a wide range of issues growing due to the deployment application of the technology, right? So if you think about the future of work and how it's disrupting our work kind of workforce, how are we preparing people for that? How are we preparing jobs? How are we preparing, um, you know, uh, the job disruption essentially and what people are going to do or how countries, governments are, you know, developing policies and, and thinking about these issues, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that is a, it's, it's essentially a large growing social issue. And, uh, you know, governments around the world, industries are debating um, that. And so on that sense, we have social projects involving, you know, building human capacity, upskilling, those mm-hmm. types of issues. Um, and then you have ethical implications, right, which is, we were briefly discussing that before when we had all the technology yeah. disruptions. The, the irony, <laughs> right? Technology <laughs> destroying our ability to have the conversation. But go ahead. Sorry, I interrupt. Correct. Yeah, correct. Um, and so ethical implications, right? Um, it's very interesting because um, as we, as humans, um, essentially automate our decisions to machines, we have to think about many things that we never really had to think about before, right? How do we, um, you know, tell now the machines what to do in certain situations? And that mm-hmm. raises a wide range of ethical issues, right? I think before I was just using the example of self-driving cars, right? We, as humans, we drive every day and we make 
you know, thousands and thousands of decisions, and we don't really think about how we do it. Um, most of them are not necessarily rational, right? And as you're driving and you might be facing an accident, you will quickly, in a matter of seconds, make a decision about we turn right, mm. left, you know, how do you prioritize? And with self-driving cars, we're now going to have to tell the car what to do in those circumstances, right? And that raises a wide range of issues. Um, you know, who does that? Is that the factory? Is that you mm. that's buying the car? Um, you know, do you get to choose what life the car prioritizes? Is that your life, your family, the pedestrian, right? So oh obviously a lot of ethical, ethical issues, right? And um yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I was actually in the philosophy conference a few days ago in Saudi and having a lot of these conversations with philosophers because they have a large role to play in a lot of these hard questions involving AI and technology. Yeah. And, you know, um, what is the right thing to do in certain situations? And what are they saying? Well, and that thing that we have as humans, which is not rational and lead us to make thousands and thousands of decisions daily, that is, we might call intuition, yeah. we might call it, I don't know, your spirit, your heart, Yeah. Uh, right? There's a lot of different interpretations to that. Machines will never have that, right? But they were still making decisions for you. So, right? Right, we, and... It's like the th the crazy thing is though, ethically, um, it's like even the decisions we make become a become a um, a, cu a culmination of all the other decisions we've made before and how that went, and the memory and the and our ability to kind of uh, disconnect maybe emotion that might have influenced a decision in the past or trauma. Like there's so many things that, that our cellular memory, rational memory that our, that then go into future decisions. Um, I guess machines can learn by kind of going through scenarios and, and different things, but, but there is an element that is just not human to that. And therefore are we eliminating that which is human <laughs> And what is uniquely, wonderfully human um, out of, of like, are we eliminating ourselves in the process? Exactly. Like and I think that can be good and bad. It can be good because our humanity is replaceable, right? There's a lot of growing concerns as well about machines replacing us. Um, eventually, that is not necessarily the case. We are unique, Right. Yeah. Um. But in the same, the, the also raises issues as machines never have the capacity that we have to analyze situations in the same way. They be, they told something through basically analyzing amounts, large amounts of data. That's sure. essentially what AI is. Um, yep. And it has a capacity to do that, which we humans can't do. Yeah, um, and the speeds that, that you and I cannot even comprehend how quickly they can take copious exactly. amounts of information. Exactly. So that is beneficial to us because we can use across different sectors and apply that to our benefit. But it also leads us on this path that we have to now think about. Essentially, we are building a new world, right? Questions that we have now or will not, you know, will not be the same in 30, 40 years time and the same way. When we think about the internet, right? You mm. and I, um, you know, I'm guessing we're the same age here. So if we think about, we saw the, you know, the internet really yeah. come into life, right? We saw how the Absolutely. technology expanded to transform our lives. And at the time that this started, no one really predicted the issues that we currently have right. around cybersecurity, mental health, um, you know, all the dark side, all the problems that also came to the Of surface, course. Right? Yeah. I mean, with every solution to a problem, with every convenience um, we create to being able to outsource and do, we are, we, we are inadvertently always creating more problems down the line. And we always will. I mean, the best of inventions will also inadvertently create 
some problems that may even be bigger than the original thing. I mean, social media could be an experiment like, hey, we are so connected and we're able to kind of do all these things. And yet we see how destructive it can be in the hands of children and, and adults that just don't know how to, um, mm. you know, you know, kind of use it for good. Right. I mean, absolutely. Um, yeah. And so I guess the challenge is, I mean, as I think of AI, like, do you see this ending in its current trajectory in a more dystopian kind of future? Or do you actually see the, I mean, you're at the coal face of trying to make sure we make decisions right now. Are we at, are we at a, are we at a kind of crossroads right now? Is this, is, is, um, do you see the governments, do you see people actually paying attention and making decisions? Like what's your assessment of the current situation? Yeah, yeah. So I want to bring back to something we were talking about before because I think this is quite important, right? I was talking about how we humans, there's recent research which analyzes that our capacity to essentially when we're faced with long, long-term risks, things like, you know, that involve catastrophic um, issues um, such as climate change, right? We mm. we have a hard time in putting that into action and thinking about how, what we do about it, right? We When we mm. face into, um, and part of it is that for anything we feel powerless, the human brain thinks about how do I deal with that? I just push that aside, right? Mm. And um and we now have, you know, climate change, I think, to prove that point. Um, oh, yeah. And so, you know, a large part of this work and I think growing conversations in the industry, it's thinking about how do we bring this conversation um, into lenses of urgency mm. and, 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 and so people can relate to this and think about how does this affect me and what can I do about it, right? I, I talk a lot in, you know, I teach at universities and I talk to a lot of young people and they often say things like, you know, we think about, we, are, we know, the, the, you know, the, the issues relating to social media, what can I do about, right? You know, I'm, I need to use technology. What's my role in this, mm. right? And I bring back to, um, you know, when we think about the sustainable goals, right? Sustainable goals are, you know, the 17 goals that United Nations put forward. Sure. And these are essentially relating to how we improve in the world that we live in. There's a critical issue such as food distribution, water, energy, right? Um, that we had to achieve by 2030. We have 80 years left, essentially, right? across 17 goals, right? And, um, you know, um, poverty and, you know, it covers a wide range of issues, including relating to your work as well, right? Around yeah. refugees and so on. So where to start? I mean, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> a place that I like to get the young people thinking about is these goals, right? Yeah. Um, but then our biggest issue is, time really time we have little time now and um the reason i'm so passionate about ai and technology mm. is that due to its, its capacity to accelerate these goals right AI yeah is something i that mean can amplify. it can actually help if you put the right kind of the right digits into the equation, <laughs> it can actually go in, you know, a long way to helping us, right? Which is the beautiful power of of this. It's almost like discovering the lever, right? One minute you can, you know, try and move this massive big boulder. If you tried with your bare hands, you'd be impossible. But then suddenly, you know, you discover if you've got this really long tool and you use the power of leverage, you need quite a little bit of effort to actually remove this massive kind of stone and technology i mean i guess that's technology right it's 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 technology that has brought us to where we're at um i guess my question is do you see us doing enough do you uh, do you see signs of positive change i i i when i look to the young like generation generation younger than me the z's and my kids and stuff like that i i see them prioritizing again um those 
the sustainable goals. And can I just say, I don't like the word sustainable. I heard someone say, um, we really need to be using the word thriving. You know, like if we just think of sustaining, we're kind of almost setting our goals like to a point of just equilibrium when what if we actually thought we could actually reverse the trajectory and actually create a flourishing, thriving, replenishing uh, future and, um, you know, like w- what we're – do you see we us doing enough to to kind of live into that future of thriving that because you 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 again before when we got cut out you mentioned this this thing you like to do with your you know audiences when you speak to them is you imagine the future and and I think if I think of you know 30 40 years time into the future I don't want to I want to think of a world that's flourishing and thriving not just a world that's kind of just teetering on sustainability like that's I guess something that can be an inspiring way to help us to look is to, well, if we imagine what we want to be, then maybe we can, um, maybe we can make the decisions now to kind of, to get there in hopefully in exponential fashion. So two two questions, are we doing enough? And if we're not, what do you suggest we should really be prioritizing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so just to clarify to the listeners, I guess, that missed part, half of the conversation before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I normally like to get um, in conferences and presentations. I, I have a lot of, especially young people, thinking about closing their eyes and thinking, how do you imagine 2050 to look like? So for you, Tim, I can see you closing your eyes right now. What are you, tell me, what are you imagining? Honestly, I'm just seeing my grandkids playing at my feet um, in long grass. I don't know. I see nature. I see laughter. I just see, I just see just, you know, like being real. Yeah. In that place of, you know, yeah. You know. And I like that question because, you know, when I was talking about long-term risks and our tendency to, you know, we can't quite relate to that. Um, I think that this is the type of questions that, that people take it very personally because they immediately can visualize their kids or they can, you know, immediately think about family or themselves, right, 30, 40 years from now. And that is, is you know, straight away places a sense of urgency, right, into a lot of questions. Um, I agree with you. I'm very hopeful seeing this new generation. They are the people that are purchasing from companies that are doing the right thing, mm. right? They are looking at, uh, you know, again, I'm going to use the sustainable word again, but. Oh, no, no, um, you use it. I <laughs> stole that. I stole that disdain from somebody else, so I can't really claim yeah. it. But I liked it. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I thought it was good. Um, you know, look, they. This generation is looking at sustainable choices and, frankly, doing things that we didn't do in our generation, right? Um, Questioning a lot of new choices and so on. Mm. So there's been a lot of examples recently, right, of large, large brands that did the wrong thing and essentially lost a lot of, you know, uh, followers. Customers. Yeah, correct, because they were essentially, their customers were the young people, the young generation, right? And I think that's amazing. Uh, Does that happen? Does that happen intentionally? Does it happen just because you become big? Like, uh, is there, is, can you be big and massive and highly profitable and still kind of do it the right way? Like, I mean, part of me, um, and I've had these discussions with other people, sorry to, to divert, but, you know, it does come down to, you know, money and purchasing power and where we where we put our money and, and who ends up becoming, you know, the big corporations actually have a lot more power and weight than some governments in the world, you know, their, their influence yeah. and sway. Yeah. So is, is it, you know, is this whole, whole method of, driving profits and and I guess unfettered capitalism that actually is kind of part of this like like that I wonder that like 
Is yeah. there a role to dismantle the big? Is there a role yeah. to kind of create kind of friction to make sure? Um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting studies on that, actually, that demonstrate the financial link between building trust. So doing the right thing, getting people to trust you. And is that financially rewarding, right? Research is showing again and again and again that that is the case. If we look at Apple, for example, they've been making constant changes to increase privacy, doing the right thing and so on. And and mm. they've along the way, they've also have proven um, you know, financial rewards attached to that. Now, that message can be different if your business model will never allow for that. And that is relevant to the social media conversation. Mm. It's absolutely impossible to do the right thing if your social, if your business model is attached to the fact that you need to get people from 10 to 15 years old to spend 30 minutes on your platform and they are the product, right? Because it's free. So how can you possibly do the right thing? I have I have had this conversation with various people in the industry that have worked for these companies. You're and, blowing uh, my mind. This is crazy. These problems, right? So they're essentially developing artificial intelligence. They're working inside these technologies. They have a target, right? These kids, I need them to spend 30 minutes here on my platform, right? How do we do that? This is very real. And... And honestly, I don't know the answer to that because that is the business model, right? We that that saying, right. if it's free, mm-hmm. you are the product, right? And that goes to YouTube, Meta, and and so on, right? So, I mean, you're blowing my mind. I mean, obviously, uh, that's scary when it comes to children who haven't developed the ability to understand maybe they're more um, maybe children aren't maybe i'm uh, maybe maybe it's it, 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 it's no different from most adults anyway that in a that inability to kind of um to judge like to not give in to those base desires of like when something says something have this now you can get it i mean it's so easy for us to 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 kind of give in right like they're our, our base kind of um well, i mean um and the way that they've been designed i mean you know they design essentially basing on our brains how our brains work right it's a reward system and you, right. you can do that and you, and that's how you get kids to become addicted and so on right so oh, quick, oh so uh, fear can be a huge thing that drives fear, maybe FOMO, missing out, obviously, which is what drives a lot of people's financial decisions, keeping up with the Joneses, uh, reputation, being liked, getting likes, all of those, all of those things that, that kind of, that kind of address, you know, the shame that so often many of us have, if I can be liked and improve my reputation and feel good. We, we we cave in to to kind of quickly satisfy, like you said, what our brain is is kind of craving. Um, the hope I do have, though, is in and it was said today that the the per, Times Person of the Year was um, Vladimir Zelensky, you know, the president of Ukraine. Yes, and the reason the reason they gave it to him was because he proved that courage is as influential or as inspiring or as powerful as fear. In other words, um, whilst we see nefarious actors in government and media and companies utilising fear and negative emotions and negative things to drive our decision-making, to kind of manipulate us to, to buy their products or to vote for them in many ways, we're actually, I'm act, we're actually seeing like a, a a turn away from like like. Hang on, we're starting to realize that that actually that promises one thing, but actually it, it it's not delivering. And courage, like in the in an example of Vladimir Zelensky, is actually delivering some pretty powerful, um, you know, um, results as we've seen in 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 a small country like Ukraine, are able to match it you know, um, albeit with the help of those around them, but 
you know, it takes a lot of courage to stay in the game, to stand there, to stay. And, 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 um, so I guess there is an element of hope that, Hey, look, if we can tap into the right, the right formula here and start, um, making some courageous decisions now in 20 years time, will those, those decisions will have, uh, exponential rewards. I mean, um, we ca- can you give us some specific examples of what maybe your institute or you would advise would be some really first kind of basic steps for you were saying young people, but for anyone listening today to kind of to do um, in order to 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 kind of um, may if even if it's prepare for their own, you know what what how do I make these moral decisions? Where's the limits? What 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 should we be thinking about and doing now? Yeah, yeah. And um yeah, just to go back to your conversation there as well on courage. I think that that um it takes a lot of courage to do the right thing and you know that from from your work. It takes a lot of courage to do social work. Right? Mm. Um you're going against the system in many many ways, right? Yeah. You have you have um it's a decision that you make and it's an ongoing decision, right? It's hard because um, it actually doesn't pay off like like in in an immediate sense. Like you're making that decision because you know it's the right thing to do and in the long run you're playing the long game not the short game. In the yeah. long run my kids are watching me and they're, I'm influencing them and they'll be better <laughs> hopeful adults if they see me doing the right thing rather if they see me doing the wrong thing and cheating and lying and 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 being lazy and not speaking to people kindly i'm teaching them okay like it might benefit me to kind of cut the corner or you know um you know if i s- accidentally uh back into someone's car while they're not there and i drive off and my kids are in the car and watch me do that you know, yeah. that short term, I got away with it can be rewarding in one sense. Cause like, yeah, I just saved myself 500 bucks. Yeah. And, but someone's looking. Right. Uh, and I, I like that. Um, you know, when we think about the most beautiful things in the world that have been created, all the people that have walked here and done amazing, amazing things. Most of the time, uh, they've died without knowing the impact, right? Some of these wow, artists, wow, come on. Some of these artists, they died without knowing how they they painting became really famous, right? I find it amazing. I I um I I'm really that. passionate about reading biographies and and history, thinking about right. And a lot of the times, the impact of what you do here, if we're good or bad, you might not see it directly right but you you are changing the world at it for better or worse every day and you're making the decision right but going back to your questions there on um our advice right yeah and i think that goes you know um it really depends on who what your what's your role right so mm. Obviously, if we think about governments and yeah. regulators around the world now, they they've been tasked with a very difficult, challenging um, task ahead, right? And that is that they have to regulate something that is completely new, um, and they have to think about new structures and policies to put in place. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has been very challenging, right? We're currently we don't have any direct laws regulating AI. Right, we have existing laws that can apply to certain effects of it, um, and regulators around the world are debating about what to mm. do or how to address these growing challenges. Right, so that is one isolated issue. There, then we have social issues, like I mentioned, the future of work. Yeah, there's a growing conversation around the world about okay, if we are automating these jobs, which we are automating a lot of administrative tasks, we will never automate soft skills, things like this conversation we're having right now, for example. If I was to use... 
Well, it's like we love it when we automate something to make it faster for us so that we can do other things with our time rather than sit, write this email to this person about, you know, will you jump on my podcast at this time and somebody else's something else or a system or an automation process is doing it, right? You got one of those emails, right? But yeah. but we hate when it's done to us, mm-hmm. right? Like how many people yeah. like hate when they have to go on that phone call and listen to that annoying fake voice and, you know, be, you know, they can't get a real person and they can't have a real experience or a real interaction to, to help process yeah. that. Instead, it's a bot on a screen having a chat with something that's it's like, no, we hate it when it's done to us because we value the human experience as, as, as an important, valuable, rich thing. But I was we- going to use your podcast as an example, actually, right? Yeah. Because, you know, it's being amazingly organized, right? And what we can see really is that the role of technology will come across everything from the invitation to organizing me to be here in front of you. Yeah. But the task of having this conversation and this conversation we're having right now, uh, AI won't be able to do that in the same way that you are doing that right now. So you won't replace you, which is good news for you, Tim. Thanks. <laughs> Thank goodness. And by the way, since we're talking about podcasts, you have a podcast too, right? I do, yes. Yeah, I what's do. it called um, and how do we I am find normally, out about it? I'm normally on the other side. So it's called, yeah, it's the same name as the Institute. So it's the AI Asia Pacific Institute. And we talk a lot about different issues relating to our work, implications of AI, and so on. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm learning from the master here. Um, (laughs) What questions do you ask people on on your podcast? What are the questions you usually ask them? You know, one of my favorite um, questions, and I normally ask people in the end, is um, what does the future hold and how do you see what where we're going and what we have to do and Mm. you get a fascinating this is when people really i think unleash their beliefs because a lot of people that i talk to might be constrained about what they can say right a lot of the times depending Mm. on who they work for Um, as you can imagine right if you're inside um you know twitter or uh meta there's certain things that you shouldn't be able to say on a podcast right because you know (laughs) and so might get censored um but with that question i have found that um it's interesting because people again take that question quite personally and they really say what they would like to see whether it's positive or negative right This episode is brought to you by The Just Travel Company, your socially responsible travel concierge. Just Travel is the best kept secret in culturally immersive and justice-oriented adventures. Allow Just Travel to take the hassle out of your next trip and experience wonder and unearth justice. Discover the just way to travel today. Simply head on over to just-travel.co to learn more and book your next adventure like our flagship Israel-Istanbul trip, launching out in mid-July 2023. I think it comes back to courage because we know, I think deep down, there's a a book I've recently read called Humankind, and it's written by like a 20, I think it was 27 Dutch kind of philosopher guy, getting back to the role of philosopher. I mean, to be 27 and to be, writing books the way he's writing it was good but it came back down to this you know this inherent belief really that people deep down are good like deep down they want something beautiful and you know if you smile at someone at the cash register they're going to smile back at you for the for the most part unless i'm having a completely miserable day you know and this ability to kind of reciprocate um you know um affection if you someone smiles at you you smile back like deep down obviously we can be suspicious 
and we grow to become suspicious. I think of my kids, you know, they're just so trusting and so whimsical and so easy to make friends that don't judge, that don't think. And it's almost, we grow into these issues and problems, but deep down, deep down in that little boy, Tim, that little girl, Kelly, like there's this, there's this belief in, in something that which is good and hopeful in the future. Um, I think it just takes the courage for us to actually believe that again. Yeah. And to, I I love the idea of like, let's, let's just stop and start hoping again and start asking ourselves, what do we really want? Yeah. And I think you just answered my question, which you asked me before, am I hopeful and what should we do? And what you just said, I think, covers exactly what I have in mind and the use of technology for that, because why do we not, the reason we don't always make, you know, even though we are, you know, our inner beings are naturally kind, we might make other decisions or we might Mm. have biases come to the surface when we're making those decisions and so on, right? This is the power that we have with technology. So I'll give you an example, right? If we think about how judges make decisions, right? The research Mm. shows that um, more often than not, issues such as um, a person's social status or race uh, might influence a judge's decision, uh, right? Or Mm. and that is um, that is often a natural. characteristic of human beings right now could we apply artificial intelligence to address that issue could we apply it to avoid you know bias in court Um, and what happens is if we have you know research also shows that judges when given enough information and analytical decisions they can actually use that to you know, reinforce and relearn how they should address certain issues, right? So AI in that sense has the ability to process that information and show you, uh, you know, compare uh, and and show you where those biases are and how you should address them. I mean, just imagine the 12 jury, the 12 juries that have the same decision-making power. But sorry, I cut you off. You were going. But in that... So in that... In that sense, we could, if that was to work, we could essentially be applying artificial intelligence to address actual biases in court. Not only court, but if you think about the same thing in a hiring process, right? When you go to an interview, yeah, right? Um, you go to an interview um, as an Asian or as a black mm-hmm. person or as a white person, you know, then naturally there are biases in society and we've seen this coming to the surface, right? Um, more than more than ever, I think, in the last few years. So could we the same way apply artificial intelligence to highlight those issues in the hiring process and take away the biases that might come with that, right? So if you're a woman sitting for an interview, if you're a mother, if, if you've you, got uh, some form of disability correct. in some can way. Can we look at can you actually perform on this job? Do you have the qualifications instead? The the, be- the frustrating and the beautiful thing at the same time is, is that we've created a world that has really kind of revolved around the decision makers, the people in power, in their own bias, create and develop things from their perspective. I heard recently that there's an increasing number of women in the construction industry, you know, this because of technology, because now you don't need to just have big brawn muscles to, and whatever the, not that women don't have big, strong muscles and aren't capable of, of working those, but that, that kind of environment of like, well, no, uh, anyone can use this tool and technology to kind of build and to create, But when you have a woman or when you have someone with a maybe a disability or involved in that process on the field, on the ground, they get to design through their world, through their way that they see the construction and the buildings and the homes and the architecture and everything with that 
with that now input into it rather than, you know, what is traditionally been. I mean, we, we, you know, a man's world, a white man's world, say in, in the, in those countries of, of, of um, where, you know, maybe more Western countries where that is the predominant kind of um, power structure. Um, and you, yeah. you know, you see it in the Middle East in certain, you know, certain cultural dynamics that have created worlds that revolve around um certain minority really at the end of the day don't take into account the diverse wonderful beautiful rich world that we are yeah i mean you would see that in really in practice with your work as well right in, in terms of retraining ups killing refugees to be placed back in society right we can't ignore the fact that they they will face um a lot of discrimination biases. yeah correct yeah. Can I just say the best day in You Belong happened two days ago. Well, what are um, you going to say right now <laughs> in uh, this interview? <laughs> the best thing that happened today, definitely, I mean, I was cleaning basically garbage wheelie bins all day today. So uh, it didn't take much to top this, but this has been thoroughly enjoying conversation best thing that's happened today has been this conversation and we're still having it. So I'm enjoying it thoroughly. However, two days ago, yeah. Yeah. what happened? We, um, we hired our new lead, our new leader for our work amongst refugees in Toowoomba. Her name is Kinda Falah from Syria. And she is a former refugee from Syria. She is just, I mean, I looked, I, I, I hired her before even reading her CV. I got her CV today and looked at it and I'm like, oh my gosh, not only is she like just an incredible person um, to have spoken to and, and met and talked about and heard about. Um, and again, you know, I think, um, uh, uh, you know, her CV just kind of backs up and blows her out of the water even more. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, I mean that in every good way she is going to be now leading our work. Um, Amazing. And to me, that's like in many, in much of, of what, of, uh, you know, coming back to the systems and the, and the, and the power structures and maybe creating a just world and using AI to create a just world to help our decision-making, you know, um, it makes so much sense for us to do that because if we're an organization focused on, meeting the needs and empowering refugees, we need someone to lead that work that has the experience, the knowledge, and, um, you know, is able to relate in so on so many ways that you and I wouldn't be able to relate. And we need to then pr provide the support and empowerment around that to enable them to do their job rather than it being the other way. Oh, we're going to just have some, you know, um, white man lead lead the role, and we'll get the refugees to help support them to to inform them how to do the job. We've got to flip that on its head. I think we have to flip that on its head in so many systems, in so many areas of of society, because um, and this is where it comes down to governance. This is where it comes down to policies. This is where it comes down to research and how important your work is, because. A lot of this stuff are systems, systems that yeah. have been put in place because laws and policies have been put in place. And so how yeah. do we make sure we're rewriting the rules to the game? Yeah. And but can I say that is also exactly why I'm so hopeful because, you know, I think this growing conversation on the link of these issues and financially and financial rewards do which are a new generation thinking about this, investors wanting to see what companies are actually doing about diversity. Don't just tell me that you're being diverse. I want to actually see how do you do that mm -hmm. on a daily basis? How do you implement that? Same conversation, artificial intelligence, right? How, how are you actually, when you're developing your systems or deploying, how are you actually trying to comply with these principles, ethical principles, right? Can you demonstrate to me that in practice as opposed to just saying? So we're moving yeah. from that place of being in this sort of, you know, um, conversation on a virtue signaling to tokenism you know yeah. trying to tick Virtual. all the boxes but not actually right. really 
into actually demonstrating, you know, I'm, I'm having conversations daily, weekly with investors and, you know, uh, financial institutions who now want to see proof of companies actually doing this. So I'm very you mentioned hopeful. You mentioned that you're involved in angel investment and other kind of other kinds of roles. Um, uh, one, angel investment sounds amazing. Um, what is that and how kind of, because you brought that up with the whole like, hey, we want to invest in the future. We want to invest in companies and and organizations and services that are doing the right thing or that are aligning with the sustainable goals or that are kind of creating the future that I think we can all sign off and agree. Like we all want to see our kids thriving and not with mental illness and challenges. We want to see, you know, uh, health uh, amongst everybody, not just um, those that ha- can afford high premium health insurances. Like, I think a lot of this, you know, justice, equality, fairness um, is something we all can assign to. But, but ha- what's what's your role in in kind of um, helping people to make those decisions from an inf- you know investment perspective? Yeah, yeah. So we think about you know. Um, a lot of how this all links to, you know, the growing conversation on ESG, right? And, yeah. and you know, and we talk about, you know, environment, not not only, right, not only environment, but, you know, sustainability and, and governance. You mentioned that a few times there, the importance yeah. of that and the growing importance of that, right? And I think, you know, we think about climate change and how little time we have. And we can think about food distribution, uh, water, right? These are all, uh, you know, if we look at food distribution right now, uh, in 20 years' time, right, we will not produce enough food for the population that we currently have. And how are we working to address that, right? So if we look at some of what some of the startups, some of the companies or people that work in this space are doing, it's absolutely amazing to address and put in technology to to work on that, right? Mm. Um, food distribution is an issue, but then we have billions crazy. going to food waste at the same well, time. Well, that's what I was going to say. The irony oh. is, is that yes. like I think the amount of food we waste I think in Australia alone could like fill the whole state of like Victoria in a year. And it's like, exactly. uh, It's ridiculous. And this is where artificial intelligence comes in, right? Because it has the ability to detect, Hey, I've got this amount of food available here. I've got two days to consume this. Where can I send it? Right. Where are the people that need it right now? But that requires, Okay, AI, we need to program that in because why we all know, like it, the irony is, is the people that have so much often seem to be the ones reaching for more. Like there's almost like a point where, um, you know, and I put my hand up, two hands up for living in probably the most beautiful, wealthy, richest part of the world with med- plenty of resources. So uh, I stand accused of of the thing I'm about to say. Um, those that have plenty seem to th- still think that they need more. You know, we see when crisis happens, you know, people flocking to buy m- months' worth of toilet paper because they're freaking out <laughs> that they're not going to have enough toilet paper or the pasta and all the shells are gone within a day because we know that maybe there might be a blackout because a storm's coming. And so how do we, like... Because it's not a, a lack of is there enough, though there are, like you said, dire warnings of not being able to produce enough, but it's a lack of our ability to share. It's our lack of our ability to distribute the resources <laughs> sufficiently. So I'm not throwing out, you know, a refrigerator full of food while the person literally next door doesn't have enough money to put food on the table for their kids. That just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's happening every day. I mean, you look at one country bordering another country and the disparity there just can almost be mind-boggling. Yeah. 
And that I goes through so many different factors, right? Again, linking to our natural ability of, you know, as humans, we tend to go towards that, don't we? Um, and how do we address how do we How do we... How do we kind of circumvent that and how can AI be actually or make play a role in 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 working against our you know worst judgment of things? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's a lot of different applications going through that, right? Because it can maybe, you know, um it's a bit like your mother, right? Tim, you're not making the right choice. Do you really want to make, you know, I was in a cafe the other day and I say to my child, um, is that a good choice? You know, he was misbehaving. And then someone turned to me and said, wow, I wish, I wish someone had asked me this today. <laughs> a stranger. And I was thinking, you wow. know, can you imagine like if you had, you know, we were essentially all have our AI secretaries very soon. <laughs> Could, can you imagine if no. you could have, you know, this AI person that will, not a person, but, you know, that would turn yeah. to you and say, Tim, is that a good choice? You know, shouldn't you be more kind now? You have, you know, you have this opportunity, right? Uh, we, I never you... listened to my mom, so I don't know how well I'd <laughs> listen to my, I'd be like, shut her off right now. I'm not listening. Um, <laughs> Disactivate. <laughs> but the, the the challenge though, right? So from a philosoph philosophical point of view is, do we ever really know what the best choice is? I mean, we can assume we know what the best choice is for the greater good. We might assume that the best choice, I mean, we saw this play out in real time with the vaccinations, with, with uh, should we go and arm Ukraine and give them weapons and propagate war to defeat war? You know, like we think, and we can be we can be so convinced that we know what the right thing is to do from even from a human level that we could entrust AI to make that decision for us. But do we always really know what is going like Kantian kind of consequentialism? Like how do we actually really know what the outcome is going to be? Because what if what if allowing someone to go to war and do something was going to actually inadvertently um that would self-destruct you know or or yeah i don't know how to explain it like i'm trying to give an example of where you know the the person oh um that broke into a house right and you know did some terrible thing but in the end uh you know in by breaking into the house they discovered something even more nef you know worse that kind of saved someone's life in the end right like at what point do you decide did that person get does that person get arrested for breaking into the house or do they get rewarded for saving someone's life essentially you know yeah. at, like like these are the ethical then dilemmas that mm. are almost like uh if we humans can't figure out that and if we humans bicker day and night about what is right and wrong, how are we going to get AI to kind of like do that for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. And and also considering how different we are, right? Um, you know, you, you know, you might be someone coming from a specific culture. You might be raised in a certain way. Someone on the other side of the world might have had a different, completely different experience, right? So they would decide that differently, right? <laughs> Ethics is not something that it's universal also. Mm. So one of the issues that we have is that we have a lot of growing frameworks around the world about how to ethically approach AI. Um, the, the challenge is for most of these types of issues, and I, I have always been passionate about international issues and thinking about you know, what's the role of international law here? How does cooperation address this, right? The issue with ethics is that we would have to arrive at a certain universal approach to AI because it's a, it's a global issue. It's, it's not a something global that... world we live in, right? Everything Correct. impacts everything. We're not living on an island that no one else has heard of and we're not impacting them, right? Correct. But then how do we arrive as a society mm. in a common ground, right? Whereas you said, there's also a lot of power imbalances and interests uh, which well, come yeah. into play. 
I mean, how do we? Because, I mean, like, I think most of our challenges and issues are um, around things. Um, we think the other side is wrong or bad or and we're good, but really it's just a clash of values. You know, I might value you know, freedom and autonomy and in, you know, my human rights and, you know, my personal dignity, whereas another person might value community. They might value, um, you know, like serving one another um, and corporate kind of um, community values. And again, one's not right and the other's wrong, you know, or they might value loyalty and reputation and protection of of vulnerable people in my family over you know um you know something you know like no you can't lie you have to tell the truth but they're like hang on you know like again we can be so set that what we value is more important than what somebody else values and yeah, exactly yeah i lived in asia for a long time and you know, what you see there is that shift from, you know, compared to the Western world where you have your individual rights that come first, right? As a society, mm -hmm. what you see more in Asia is that collective, um, you know, collective look towards those rights first as a community, and then yeah. your individual preferences come in, right? If you think about the approach during COVID, for example, yeah, the way that, you know, Asia respond to that was very different. People yeah. were very mindful from the beginning, right? Even, you know, before COVID, when you go into the office in Asia, people might have a cold and they are already wearing masks out of respect, right? I haven't seen that in other parts of the world. I know. I mean, I remember seeing everywhere I traveled in airports and stuff, you'd see people wearing masks like 20 years ago when I was traveling. I mean, it was just common. Right common common thing to see um, we almost laughed at it thinking it was funny like where well, they must be crazy and weird and but it's a value of the other rather than a value of my rights um yeah. to do what i want to do again i make that sound like that's a bad thing because you know i've lived in countries where people don't have rights that i mean women don't have their own rights and can't make their own decisions and you can't vote for who you want to vote for you have to ask what your father and your family is voting for and then you get that so again there's there's no it's not to determine what's right and wrong it's to, it's more it's more the clash of values i think that that make it difficult for us to arrive at universal and then you've got religious ideologies and you've got um yeah, just so many um, experiences that we've all had, uh, traumas that we bring to the table that say, that that will say, you know what, I had this experience in the past, and this is how it turned out. There's no way I'm gonna allow this, you know, this to happen here. Like for example, you know, we had here we had um, the, the resettlement of women and children from Syria that had the women had gone over to to kind of support, uh, they were ISIS brides, right? They went over to and they got captured and they got taken into a, a terrible, terrible refugee camp in the middle of, of, of Syria. It's more like a, a prison. And yet the Australian population here didn't want to accept these women and children back to Australia and large portions because they were afraid that they were allowing their radicalised thinking back in here. They made the wrong choice to go in the first place. Again, like... Um, these are, these are kind of like, what do we value more? Like, what's the right thing to do? It's really, you know, it's really, it can be really challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, to kind of bring it back though, like I'm a real proponent of, because we don't know the future, we don't know, like a lot of the decisions that a lot of governments might instill on us is if we don't do this, this terrible thing's going to happen. Therefore we need to close the borders or we need to stop this or need to do this. Like if we, if we let humanity make its own mind up, then it's all going to be terrible. And I'm like, hang on. Um, I want to choose to believe that if we let people in that 
the best of them will come out. If I, if I trust you, Kelly, if I show you that I trust you to take care of my child, there's a good chance that you'll take care of my child because you don't want to let me down because you've, you've appreciated the fact that I've shown trust in you to, to take care of my child. And yeah. I think that's back deep down. Part of me is like, can't we lean into that as a society? Why do we have to, why do you think we lean into the assumption maybe that? Um, because it's being broken. You know, I, I was thinking about this actually on the children example that you've just used, um, observing how the education system has changed, right, over the years and uh, observing my son's school, for example. Um, they have a policy where teachers, he's five, and, you know, say if he's coming from swimming class and he needs to change into his, you know, uniform, he cannot have a teacher touching him to help him to get change or any assistance going to the toilet or so on, right? And the reason mm. for that is, of course, that in many cases yeah. bad things have happened in the past. Of course. And that is extremely sad as a society that now, you know, we have kids being raised very differently, right? Um, and we see this across a lot of different issues, right? The refugee example is one that, you know, always gets to me. And I, you know, I know you're deeply passionate about this. And I think about when society has a problem letting refugees in, they worry. One of the arguments, right, is that they worry about, uh, you know, losing, they stealing their jobs. <laughs> and I'm thinking, if you really worry that a refugee who is, you know, coming here does not speak English, um, you know, is learning life almost from the ground to steal your job, there is something wrong, not with, not with the refugee, but with you. <laughs> Come on. Right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> really? Yeah. Right? And maybe deep down they know they'll work harder. Maybe deep down they'll know they'll cherish the fact that they got a second chance and they'll be grateful to the country and the people that have said, you're welcome, you can be safe here. Maybe deep down we're afraid that we'll get shown up for our own comfort and privilege that we are um, sitting on. I mean, maybe, or, or maybe we just, maybe we're just not, um, maybe we've just been sold a lie, right? And we've spent too much time on the news and on social media and in the hands of people that want to exercise their control over and their agenda over our lives. I mean, I think I I think about the future and when I when you asked me that question I was thinking about you know nature and being being like I didn't imagine being in an um in the metaverse with my child uh, pretending to be somewhere else than where I am right now on this beautiful planet. And it sounds weird saying this while I'm talking to a screen to someone on the other side of the world into a microphone, but, but like, um, it's fun to have these conversations, but it's more fun to have the real conversation with in person in real life. Right. No, absolutely. And I think we're seeing that with the pandemic, right? And the way people are valuing encounters more and, you know, conferences. And when you're in the same room with someone, right, it's a different connection. Uh, um, but also, you know, the metaverse, it's interesting that you touched on that. I, I think, again, we'll create a whole new world, right? Which we are, we don't even really, we can't really glimpse of. Right. What that well, would it's be like. it's so many more possibilities, right? I mean, it's not like my identity isn't like I chose to identify with the New York Mets and therefore I wear this hat and I get to choose what colored 
clothes and what fashion and what style you get to choose how you have your hair and what color it is soon you're going to be able to change whether your avatar is going to be like some alien or some lizard and you know there's just so many elements of how then you can then present your identity and present yourself out in the universe the metaverse um so the possibilities seem endless but deep down though like I am somewhat suspicious that with all this progress, are we missing out on what's really like tangibly like in like in our grasp as human or are we becoming too machine? Are we becoming too digital? Are we becoming too? And we already seen that, right? Exactly what you're saying. There's a philosopher that I love his work because, Harari. Um, Noel Harari. Yes. Yes. And he talks a lot about how we've made so much technological progress, but we are actually as a society not happy that we used to be 200 years ago. Right? Yeah. Or this is the studies. We are more connected than ever yet. Um, and I was looking at, I was actually reading about it this morning. An article just came up talking about the rate of, suicide among, among teenagers, right? And and the, the, the numbers are alarming, right? And there is now new research also showing the link that that has with technology and how, you know, all the implications of, you know, you're, you're no longer just being faced with challenges at school as a teenager, but when you come home and you're connected 24 hours, there's a whole yeah. new range of issues and implications that we didn't have growing up that they are going through right now. And, and I'm not sure how well society is prepared or how parents are currently being educated to deal with that or respond to that. Right. Um, I, I don't, I don't believe that iPads and iPhones should be hanging out to kids less than 15 years old freely uh, without parent parental control. First of all, well, they're giving um, them to my kids at grade at school at grade eleven. I mean, not grade I eleven. At eleven cool. years old. At eleven years old. Yeah, but I would think that it's cool. At least it's being monitored to a certain extent. Yeah. Or at home by parents. It, it's just becoming like this is the modus operandum, though, for getting anything done now is with a screen in your hand. Well, fair enough. I mean, I, I get it, but. Uh, I kind of like what you were saying though about about limiting, and again, this becomes down to like policies and and regulations, things we hate being put imposed upon us because that imp- you know restricts my individual right to decide what I want to do. But yeah, it's fascinating, right? Because you know, with my background in law. The more I've moved into technology, the more I've become more and more passionate about law and justice because mm-hmm. you really see the role, the large role that law, justice, these limits have in society. And this, without that, really, you know, that is the only way for a lot of these issues. So, um, which we yeah. should say you're a, du- du- a dual qualified law a lawyer, both in common and civil law. You've led the International Law Association, the ILA, <laughs> as president of the Victorian chapter in Australia. I mean, you are. I love how, I love how you're reading my bio now. I, I love, the conversation has been good. <laughs> what I'm saying is, is like if you haven't got this already, if you're listening, like. You are an incredibly accomplished, high achieving individual. And what inspires me the most is to channel all of that energy towards wanting to create a better world, wanting to create. And as I like to say, create a world where we all belong, where um, an inclusive world, where the pure acceptance just for who you are, where you're at when you're when you're at that stage because you know uh i can only ever accept someone where they're at where they are right now <laughs> if i accept them before they get there like if, uh, once they get to a certain place you know um then am i ever really accepting anyone you know like yeah. uh 
So I love that you've channeled it towards this fight. And I love that you described yourself. Can you explain this? You described yourself as a wannabe ball- ballerina at heart and boxer in spirit. Like, I was, I was, like, I, was I love the, I I love the picture. I love the picture of that. I see this tutu <laughs> with like, like, tape around her ankles not to not to to kind of support her uh, support her you know petite feet but so that she can do some ridiculous kick you know karate kick chop on on uh, some you know bad guy so what what's that all about so i was a ballerina uh, as a child okay uh, which is why i had three knee surgeries um, oh. and that cannot do ballet or many other impact sports anymore. But um, there's something so beautiful. I'm so passionate about ballet and I still love watching it. Mm. There's something so delicate and uh, it shows discipline and it's just beautiful watching it, right? Um, it's, it's Exactly, oh, yeah. And I think about that, all the discipline and um the the move of Strength how delicate you can be correct align with as a boxer because you know the challenge of um doing social work or advancing any good in the world is a constant challenge uh but how do you advance that in a way that you know, you would if you're a boxer, right? So if you think about yeah. what they do is they, they fall and they get up. They fall and they get up until they Come can't on. anymore, right? But they don't stay on the ground. And I feel that, oh, that I if love you can that. combine those two, uh, that is a powerful way of looking at it. A resilient ballerina that knows how to land a knockout blow. I love that. And that, that, I mean, look, you're a force to be reckoned with. Um, I dare anyone to get in your way, Kelly. I'm so <laughs> proud of your dedication. Um, hats off to your husband, Jesse, who I, uh, we, he and I were just getting to become really great mates when he was uh, down here surfing together and just hanging out and chatting and going on long walks together and hearing your heart for what you want to do as a family and, um, and how you're, you know, it's taking you around the world. It's taking you to places like right now in Dubai. Um, I'm really proud of you. I'm proud of the work that you're doing. Um, I'm going to keep conniving ways for us to keep in touch and to hopefully do some great work together. Um, I'd love, you know, uh, you've already got a standing invitation to be a key advisor for You Belong. Um, and uh, and any if there's any way that we or myself and others out there can kind of support your work, learn more about your work, um, get in touch with you, how would they do that? Um, how do they get onto your podcast and educate themselves even more? Just give us the big run through and we'll also put it in show notes as well. Yeah. So, well, I'm across most social media platforms. Uh, there's no way of not being right now. <laughs> uh, so you, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. You can find me there. Um, you can jump into our website as well. Um, it's just AIAsiaPacificInstitute.org. And you will be able to get into our social media places from there as well. Um, yeah. And looking forward to hearing from you. Can people email email you? Is there your email on that website? What's the best way to? Yeah, you'll be able to find my email there as well, or the, awesome. the institute. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, get out get out there. Reach out to Kelly. Um Support the work. I'm sure they've got obviously lots of, I, I love how much research and informed, um, you know, academia that you, you employ in your work. Um, um, look forward to um, hearing more um, of what happens with your work in the future. Um, dear friend, thank you once again. Uh, I just think anybody listening to my podcast must think I'm the luckiest guy on the planet to have such amazing friends and people in my life doing so many good things. I pinch myself every day and um, I hopefully we'll, um, we'll see you soon. 
whether it be here in Australia or in the Middle East. Thanks for making it to the end of another episode of Justice Matters with Tim Buxton. It is an immense privilege to share these conversations and inspiring people with you. To learn more about how you can get involved or learn more about today's guest, head on over to the show notes or episode description. This podcast was produced by the master himself, Jose Biotto, with just a little bit of help from me. The featured music is the song Turning Over Tables by The Brilliance. Lastly, to my Patreon community out there, thank you so much for your support and generosity. Without you, this podcast would not be possible. If you'd like to become a Patreon and get exclusive access to behind the scenes content, visit patreon.com forward slash justice matters and start your give what you can monthly contribution today and join me and so many others in creating a world where everyone belongs. Until next time, thank you for subscribing and sharing this podcast with your friends. Justice Matters with Tim Buxton acknowledges and pays respect to the past, present and future traditional custodians and elders of this nation, now known as Australia, and the continuation of cultural, spiritual and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples.